Hello everybody and welcome to another of our Aw Shucks preview videos in which we do not review games. This might look like a shut up and sit down review, it is not. What this is, is shut up and sit down, demoing games on behalf of publishers who, due to the pandemic, cannot make it to conventions to show off their games. So I'm doing it for them! May the devil have mercy. And also, I'm gonna be showing off some nifty duds from ludocherry.com who make vintage clothing inspired by tabletop games. And I am really impressed uh, by these shirts that they've sent me. So if you want them, you can head to ludocherry.com. But if you want this, you'd better listen up. This is Lawyer Up by Rock Manor Games and designed by Samuel W. Bailey and Mike Nade. And if you've played games like Watergate or the Arkham Horror card game, uh, card games that basically tell a very thematic story using cards, uh, this is very much a game in that vein. But it's a two-player game about law, about courts. One player is gonna be the prosecution. Another player is gonna be the defense, and you're gonna pick cases to fight your way through. So a bit like scenarios in the Arkham Horror card game, you know, a case is gonna be just a big chunky deck of cards with evidence and witnesses and story and setup rules, but this is cool. So what I've got set up here is the first case, case 00, which is all relating to an art forger. But what's nice is there's lots of different ways to set it up. This is what's called the short game, but we could add in more art if we wanted to simulate a law case that's even more focused on art and forgeries. Or we could add this deck with a spiderweb symbol, which is going to relate to the art forger's connections in international crime syndicates and politicians. Or to play a supersized version of the first case, you could play with the base set and crime connections and art, and all that gets shuffled together. So even within each case, I mean, A, there's different ways to set it up. B, you're not gonna see all the cards in it. So these cases are all pretty replayable. What we've got in front of us is starter decks for both players that will always be used. A deck of evidence for the case. We have a judge. We have some key witnesses that are gonna change uh, depending on how you set the case up. And we also have 12 jurors here. Oh, and two little dials that are gonna keep track of your points. A case is made up of several phases, but the first is a draft. So before you actually get to the court, apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently lawyers have to like prepare for the case and try and find evidence and stuff. Uh, so that's what this first phase represents. You're gonna take the entire deck and you're gonna, three at a time, divvy it up to both players like so. And then both players are gonna look at the three cards they've got, which are gonna be relating to evidence to do with the case or surprise witnesses, I wanna say. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, no, looks like it's entirely evidence, uh, at least in this first case. Then, of the three cards that each player received, you're gonna look at them, you're gonna pick one that's gonna be shuffled into your deck as evidence your lawyer will present in the case. Another, you're gonna have to give to your opponent uh, as evidence that they'll get to use in the case. And the third, you sneaky lawyer, you are going to bury. You're gonna pick a piece of evidence, go, mm, I don't want that to show up in the case at all. And it's gonna go into a hidden evidence pile, but it's not gonna be removed from the game because excellently, while a third of this deck is gonna end up as buried evidence that has been buried by the two players at the end of the draft, there are cards in the style of all good law fiction I don't know if this happens in real course, but where, you know, the lawyers are able to say, mm, you tried to bury that evidence, but I found it, and uh, thicken their deck with buried evidence in the middle of the court case. So that's fun. Anyway, you're gonna take all that evidence, it's gonna be a third drafted to one player, a third drafted to another, and a third burned. You're gonna shuffle it in with your deck, shuffle, 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 and then you're good to go. And the main structure of Lawyer Up for all the cases is all to do with witnesses. So starting with whoever has the favor of the judge, which will be the prosecution initially, because it would be weird, I guess, if a court case began with the defendant saying, you don't know why we're here, but I'm gonna explain why I'm innocent. So it's gonna start with the prosecution calling any of the witnesses. And just like a real court case, some of these witnesses are good for the prosecution, some are better for the, for the defense. Um, thematically, in this first case that I've set up, uh, like I say, it's about art forgery. Um, what we've got here is a man, the defendant, who has been found with a lot of forged art, implying some criminal connections. The defendant is gonna try and help them to get off scot-free as just a lover of art. The prosecution is gonna go, this person has so many illegal items, they've gotta be up to something. I think they should be arrested for, I don't think it actually specifically says what the charge is, but um, you get the idea. So, 
As the prosecution, let's call up this big juicy witness first. Uh, this is my art expert. Her name is Dr. Lottie Van Houten. She's an expert in the Dutch Masters and we're gonna put her here in the middle. Now the relevant numbers are the, bit, the ones in red or blue showing it's either points for the prosecution or points for the defense. And that's where these dials come in. You can immediately go bu, 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 bu. one, two, three, four. So the prosecution would have four points just from calling up an expert that backs up their argument. The defendant is gonna be stuck on zero points. Uh, but then what happens is both players will start the game, the court case rather, with a hand of five cards drawn off their randomly shuffled deck. And then we go back and forth with players sort of playing cards to this witness, to this kind of battle, until both players pass, at which point you see who has the higher total, and then that player has won the witness. It's very clear winners and losers in this court. Um, and we'll be able to sway some jurors. And at the end of the case, whoever has more jurors swayed to their side wins the case, just like in real law. Because this gets quite sort of gritty and mechanical, I'm gonna give you the rough version of this. You're gonna pick cards from your hands, which might be arguments or procedures, and then so long as the symbols on the cards you might play match up with at least one of these symbols on the witness, aha! Like so, representing your character kind of continuing arguments that were brought forward by your witness. You can play cards both for the point value, which you're gonna to add to your dial for that witness, and for the card's effect. Lots of cards will enable you to invalidate other cards. For example, if I play a piece of evidence, the defense certainly has an argument saying you can't use that evidence. So you can use those cards to negate other cards. Also, each player has three objection tokens for the entire court case that can be spent judiciously, pun intended, to invalidate arguments from one, each one player or the other. So all of this does definitely remind me of some card-driven war games that I've played, but with a much fluffier, more welcoming theme, which is super cool. So players are gonna go back and forth playing cards into these arguments, like so, duh, 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 until one player goes, ah, oh, you know what, this is, I'm burning through all my cards, I pass. The other player goes, oh, I'm happy with that, I'll pass. Uh, you tally up the totals and whoever has more points in total is going to trigger any beneficial effects on that witness who has now been sort of won by them. And then the difference in total between like the prosecution and the defense, so let's say the prosecution had 15 points here and the defense had nine, the difference between those two scores, so in this case six, you can then go shopping with it on all of these witnesses who all have different biases. So assuming that the cards you play match up to the witnesses, like if you make a very logical argument, then the logical witness will be sat up there in the stands going, I like this guy. And then the numbers on each juror card, I feel like I may have said witness back then when I meant to say juror, but I'm sure you're intelligent and knew what I meant. Um, the number is how hard it is to sway them. This guy here is a very logical person who believes in the prosecution intrinsically when the game begins and is a complete pain in the ass to convince. But this person who is manipulated by emotions, random, I didn't set this up deliberately, is very easily swayed so it can be bounced back and forth a lot over the course of the prosecution. The game is really, uh, in many respects, complicated but also, it's as simple as that. Witnesses are gonna come up, um, players are gonna play cards from hand back and forth um, to try and win them over, and then they're gonna go one way or the other. Witnesses are gonna be swayed, and you keep going until you have gone through all of the witnesses, and then you'll look at the jury and see who's won. But one thing I really like is that these decks you've got that contain arguments and evidence, when you run through them, when you finish them, um, you don't get any more. <laughs> There's no reshuffling your arguments and producing the same piece of evidence again. So you have to very carefully sort of eke out your deck over all of the witnesses. Because if you run out of evidence and arguments, and this is so good thematically, you just become a lawyer sat there thinking, mm, wish I had something else to say as your opponent continues to uh, dominate the court case. So that is a quick overview of Lawyer Up. Uh, I am quietly impressed by this. It's clear, clearly a labor of love. The art on all the cards is frequently very funny. There's some lovely interactions of theme and mechanics. And uh, yes, I have not played this, but I'll tell you what, if someone said, do you wanna play a game of this? I would say, let's give it a shot, which considering how hard I am to please, is pretty high praise. Let's see what the next game in the list we've got is.
Next up, we're looking at High Rise by the delightfully named Formal Ferret Games and designed by Gil Hover. You know that this game is going to be a little unusual and a little funny as all of Gil's work is. So what have we got here? Well, this is kind of a game in the vein of Monopoly or Lords of Vegas. I've set up a three player game here. We can see this kind of New York looking place on the board. And as you can see from these lovely and occasionally huge uh, three dimensional towers, this is a game of building three dimensional towers. And look, you can actually even put spires on the top just like they do with real towers to make them all record breaking. The reason I say that this might remind you of Lords of Vegas or Monopoly is because this is a game of players racing to build up a town sort of competitively and then also blocking spaces that might be of use to one another as we'll see in just a moment. I haven't earned this so I'm going to take it down. This I would describe as a step up in complexity if you've played games like Monopoly or Lords of Vegas. Uh, not least because while we have uh, victory points here, in the middle of the victory point track we have something called corruption. I like the way it's described in the manual. Corruption is basically a way of supercharging your abilities and actions in the game so you achieve a little bit more, build a little bit higher, but uh, unlike real life, the corruption in this game is clearly visible and is going to actually punish the people involved. Um, there's also several ways to play High Rise, not just as a solo game, which is included in the box, or a special two-player variant, uh, or three or four players. You can play it as an introductory standard or expert game, with standard and expert making the game longer and tougher, but the manual is at pains to point out if you are a hobbyist board gamer, the introductory game will be just perfect for you. All right, that is enough of a preamble. Let me walk you through how you play this game. What we have is a bunch of spaces around the edge of the board, which will be familiar to anyone who has played Monopoly, but it doesn't work with everybody taking turns. No, 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 we have something a little sexier than that. And on your turn, you'll be trying to amass building tiles to eventually construct buildings. It's really as simple as that. The person who takes their turn is gonna be whoever's furthest back on this big round track. So in the case we've got here, it's red. Where does red move? Well, pretty much anywhere. So long as red doesn't stay in the same zone, which are these groups of landing spaces, meaning you'll only be able to take one action per zone per lap of the boars. Wherever red stops is the action that red gets to take. But remember, red won't get to act again until both of the other players are in front of red. So if red jumps halfway around the board, that's great. They probably get exactly the action they want because you can't move to a space with someone else on it. But red will then have to watch as white and yellow sort of take a million little turns before they finally pass the red token. So much better to advance somewhere a little closer. Like for example, ooh, let's go here and get the juicy ultra plastic. Oh, that's red. I forgot, I'm supposed to be yellow. Oh no, no. Uh, okay, so then it would be next white, white could go to either of these two spaces, but of course not where red is, because red is blocking that space and can move on. Uh, so let's imagine that white goes a little further and stops here for this ability. Some of the spaces around the edge of the board are bonus spaces. We've set up a three player game here, so there's a couple of bonus slots here, couple here, a couple there. And what that means is that whoever passes over them first gets all of that stuff. So white in jumping across these two tokens will get those two bonuses or the other one if that's what white wants. So they would go in white's construction yard. And so whoever crosses these bonus spaces last gets uh, nothing. So that's another tactical consideration. So what are these spaces you're stopping at? Well, at their simplest, they might allow you to get construction materials, either specific ones by looking into this bag of materials or random ones. One space might offer you one specific construction material if you really need some pink, and something else might just give you two random drawers. That sounds pretty good. Um, but you are limited by the number of spaces in your personal construction yard. So at the start of the game, you can only hold seven resources. If you need more, that's no problem at all, says the game. You can have a new construction yard to store more pieces, but it's gonna cost you corruption. Lots of things in this game give you corruption, and it's pretty bad. But how bad it is, is based on uh, other players, you see? In the introductory game that I've learned and I've got set up here, the way that it works is, let's imagine our players are scattered across the corruption sheet like that. The person who only really suffers is whoever's lowest. So in this case, red is lowest, so red 
would lose two victory points in clawing their way back up to white. And that would happen at the end of the round. So corruption is always bad, but as to how bad it is, it depends on how corrupt your friends are. It's kind of like being uh, a piece of advice I got, never be the most drunk person at a party. Uh, because no one remembers the second most drunk person. Similar in High Rise, just don't be the most corrupt son of a gun around the table and you'll basically be okay. So, you've got all of these construction materials, then you might want to stop at one of these construction spaces. Now you're going to be discarding floors in order to build these beautiful skyscrapers that are going to get you points. As to how you build them, during setup, you're randomly gonna put out one of these blueprint sheets showing the exact array of different materials that you will need. So we can see here, for a two floor building, which is this tiny little cute thing here, we all need one gray, one black, and one green. Or you can use the, uh, not purple, my bad. I was thinking about green because I was thinking about these juicy ultra plastics. Ultra plastics are wild. So let's actually try and work this out. So if I'm yellow and I've got two ultra plastics, a blue, a black, and a purple. I could, uh, a blue, purple, purple. I could build this uh, nice fella up here, I believe. Yes, I certainly could. So that would be a six floor building. Uh, and then I would put that in my little sheath right here. All of the construction materials I used would go back in the bank or the bag. And I would get to put this, but where do I put this? Well, because I'm using the East Garden space, I would build in East Gardens. And within that sector, you'll notice that each of the building spaces is connected to a special power-up. Now those sort of power-up slots, we can stop on those spaces, which are randomized during setup, uh, in order to get that action or get that sort of bonus as we're traveling past. However, if you choose to build your building in one of the slots connected to that power, two things happen. First off, you get a one-time use of that power. So this space here grants you ownership of an insurance company. So if I were to build here, I would get an insurance company, just as if I were to stop my movement on that space. But there's something even better here because anyone who stops on a space that is connected to a building, so now I've got my big juicy, did I build a nine instead of a six? Oh, I did, because I was looking at that upside down. Oh, that's so embarrassing. Oh, I built a it's much smaller building than I thought. That's rubbish. Um, so when white stops on that space, which is connected to a yellow building of mine, I then get a free juicy floor. Ta-da! Now you might be wondering, if I stop at a space that contains my own building, do I get that bonus? Yes, you do, if you're willing to take one corruption point. Uh, also, another way to take corruption, if you're really excited about corruption, remember how I used this East Gardens construction site, which is why I built an East Gardens, and there's a construction site for each of the five areas of the board. You don't have to build where you're told. So I stopped and used the East Gardens construction space to build this, but I could build anywhere. I could build in the city center, which actually has no construction site because the manual says you have to get your hands dirty if you're building in the city center. Because if you build outside of where you are assigned to, that's fine, you just get you guessed it, one corruption. So that's the basic flow of the game. Players will work their way around the edge of the board, picking up special powers, and there are many, many special power cards for you to collect. You're gonna be collecting building materials, you could potentially be enlarging your construction sites, and building all these skyscrapers. Oh, I forgot the most important part. In building a six floor skyscraper, I get one, two, three, four, five, six points. So that's nice. This then continues until all three of these uh, sort of leapfrogging tokens have made their way all the way to all the way back to where they started, and that is the end of a round in High Rise. Now, if you're playing the introductory game, you're going to do this over two rounds, one of which representing 2020, and the other of which representing 2030, at which point the buildings get higher, but the materials get more demanding. However, if you were to play the advanced game, you're gonna go through 2010, 2020, and 2030. Um, and the number of rounds is super important because at the end of every round, when all the three tokens have made their way home to their little sort of bed, uh, to have a nice mogul nap at the end of the line, uh, you're going to play a little sort of um, area control game because the person who has the tallest building in each of the five districts is gonna get some extra points and the person who has the tallest building across the whole city is gonna get even more victory points. So that is a brief overview of the game of High Rise, uh, quite involved, quite innovative and thinky uh, game of throwing up massive buildings as if it's going out of style and doing your best to get points and doing your best to not get busted by the police. <laughs>
Uh, I think this is lovely, and of course it's always so nice to see a game with some three-dimensionality really bringing it up off of the table. Let's see what the next game is. Next up, we have Project L, a very mysterious box. Who designed it? Nobody knows. It's a black box with no names. That's why I wrote the names of the designers down. It's published by Board Cubator and designed by Jan Sukal, Michael Mike, and Adam Sparrow. And this is one of those games that when I'm doing a video of it for Shut Up and Sit Down, I'm gonna have to work to not just start playing it because it's one of those marvelously simple, tactile, rewarding things. Um, though I say that on instinct, as with all the Sharks preview videos, I've not actually played any of these games. So what we've got here is a game that can be played solo. There's a variant to play it with five and six, but by default, the rules teach you to play it with two to four. And this is a game about slotting cute little acrylic -y plastic pieces. These are made of the same amazing material that Azul's tiles are made of into little puzzle squares. So this is super simple. For setup, you get a player sort of aid. You get one little green piece and one little yellow piece. I just spat on my player board. That's good luck, that. And then on your turn, you can do three actions. One action you can do is to take a puzzle. Another action you can do is take or upgrade a piece. Another action you can do is put a piece in a puzzle. Another action you can do is if you don't like what's in the shop, you can take everything from one of the rows and put it on the bottom of the deck to deal out some new options. And finally, and this is kind of the heart of the game, you have the master action. And that is, you can once per turn spend an action placing one shape in all of your cards, which is of course super efficient, but also not actually necessarily gonna help you to finish any of them. So one action would be to go to the shop. We've got this deck of white easier puzzles and this deck of black harder puzzles. And uh, when this black deck runs out, that's the end of the game. So one of the actions you can take is take a puzzle, say, I think I can do this puzzle. Uh, and you've got four slots on your player aid for puzzles. You can't have more than four. Also, if you decide you took puzzles that are too big for your boots, you can't put them back, you have to get them done. So another action you can take is to take one of the pieces in your supply and didn't socket it in there. Another action you can take is go, I don't have enough pieces and upgrade them. So I could take this level one piece and upgrade it to a level two, two square piece. And I've arranged the shop here in terms of levels. So this is level one, two, three, and four. Four, these are the huge shapes. Um, but that's all written down on your player aid for you. So what did I do? I took a puzzle. I put a shape in, I upgraded a shape, that's the end of my turn, then we'll move on to the next player. But nobody cares about them. So let's go back to my turn. Uh, they're only fictional, they're not real. Look, there's no one in the chair. So uh, I can upgrade that piece again. Uh, so for action one, duh, duh. For action two, I could, well, just for action two, let me flex, oh, I, I should have refilled that. I should have refilled that. You, the shop refills as soon as you take a card. Um, I'll take a more, two. let's keep it simple. I'll take that for my second action. And for my third action, uh, I will slot this piece in here, completing a card. Now that's two things. First off, you get all the pieces back. Boof. Second, you're gonna get the shape that is printed in the top right hand corner. Boof. And third, you're gonna whap that face down into a score pile and the number in all the puzzles that you've completed is your total score plus and minus some other funky stuff. So that's the game. You're taking puzzles, you're upgrading shapes, you're getting new shapes, you're putting shapes in, you're going, what was I thinking? That's a horrible thing to do. That's it, that's the game until the black deck runs out. Then you're gonna finish the round, then you're gonna play one more round, and then you have something called finishing touches, in which if you go, oh, I, you know, oh, I was so close to finishing one of these, but I didn't quite finish it. You're gonna wanna finish it because any puzzles that are incomplete count as negative points when the game is over. So you're gonna take all the points of your completed puzzles, deduct the points of your incomplete puzzles. But as I say, you can do something called finishing touches, which is where you can, at a cost of one victory point per shape, put any number of shapes into your pieces. So if you're like, oh, I was so close, you can bung a couple of shapes in there and it goes from a negative three points to uh, positive three points. So that's it, that is Project L. Super simple, super tactile, super uh, like rewarding, I would assume. Uh, there's a variant in the manual to play it with just one player, and there is a variant to play it with five or six as well, and the problem with five or six players isn't that there aren't enough components. The problem is that the game becomes too slow, too much time waiting for your turn. So what this does, and I've seen this in some other board games before, uh, Project L ships with black and white tokens. 
Now these start at opposite ends of the board and then you take your turn when you're holding either black or white. And then once you've finished your turn, you will take that black or white token that enabled you to take it. So you get the white token, you take your three actions, you pass the white token around. But you do the same thing when the black token arrives. And the black token arrives, you go, ah, oh, I'll take my three cents. So there are kind of two active players orbiting the board at any one point. And I just think that's cool. I just think that's a cool solution to a problem that has been dog and board games for a long time. No idea who invented it first, but they're, they're pretty cool. Let's move on to the next game. That was Project L. What a nice thing. Next up in our list of previews is Flourish by James and Clarissa A. Wilson. And what we have here is a drafting game for a whopping two to seven players uh, that you might think of as a step up in complexity from Sushi Go. It's also absolutely charming. Look, we've got three dimensional little walls to separate the players in this three player game I've set up. We've got all these little 3D follies that I believe come in the signature edition, their expansion. And we have almost 100 cards with absolutely gorgeous garden illustrations. Because what you're gonna be doing here, if you've not heard of drafting games before, they're basically games where you receive cards, pick one to keep, and then you're gonna pass them on. But this doesn't quite work like a normal drafting game. What you actually do in Flourish over four rounds of play is, as you can see, everyone starts with six cards. You're gonna pick one to play, trying to engineer your garden to give you the most points, which is how you win the game, unless you're playing cooperatively, but we'll get to all the different game modes of Flourish later. You're gonna take the card that you choose, you're gonna put it face down, but then, you're gonna pick two more cards, one to give to each of your opponents. Now, if you're playing competitively, obviously you're gonna try and give them stuff that isn't useful to them. What you do is you put that on the other side of these cute little garden wall tokens, and they're gonna do the same to you. Um, but of course, so if you're playing competitively, you wanna give them junk. If you're playing cooperatively, of course, this is an opportunity to give them stuff that's useful to them. If you're playing cooperatively, you can discuss freely what cards you might want. Um, so every, sort of uh, turn, you're gonna, of your hand of six, pick one card to play, you're gonna give two away, you're gonna receive two from each of your opponents, and every player is gonna draw one card off the deck. So for rounds one, two, and three, you are always choosing from a whopping six cards. And then you're gonna do that again, until, and give, put out two more cards, and you're gonna do this until you have three cards. So at the end of a round, your hand might look a little something like, well, not your hand. The cards you've chosen to play might look a little something like this. Now, at the end of a round when you've chosen three cards of your own, then everyone reveals and scores. Now the cards that you have in front of you, they have symbols down the left that show what kind of wildlife they might have. They might also have a symbol in the bottom left showing if they have a particular human-made feature. And then the important part is what's in the top left and bottom right. In the top left is gonna show you how those particular areas score. Like I've got a card here that's gonna give me two points for every red rose in my garden. Uh, let's imagine that I was competent and had paid attention during this and had also drafted a card with some red roses on. Look, great, I did, I managed it. So that would give me four points and then I would put that on my lovely giant scoring tracker. Um, symbols in the bottom right, however, score at the end of the game. There's also a little twist as to how uh, the end of the game shakes out. Um, in round four of four, uh, in the end of round three, you do not draw a card after receiving cards from your opponent, so you're only gonna have five cards in hand. And actually, the fourth round of the game, you just choose three of these five to play and two to put back in the box. So for the whole game of Flourish, you might be sitting on cards that you're going to reveal with a flourish, I wonder if that was intentional, uh, at the end of the game, so that your opponents can't see that, ooh, this whole game you are holding a card that might give you 20 points for every path card. Uh, however, that's not all. Uh, we've got a variety of different modules you can incorporate. Uh, there are all of these medal tokens, which players draw three of at the beginning of the game, and shh, let's flip them over, da 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 Every player will be able to look at these in secret, and you're gonna get seven points for each of these ribbons at the end of the game if you have the most of the features that were that are depicted on the ribbons that were dealt to you. Also, I'm sure you're excited about these. You see these three-dimensional um, uh, folly tokens? These are a module that is included in the signature edition, um, and what you've got there 
is you're going to lose five points for every one of your five personal uh, little structures that you haven't placed at the end of the game. But uh, at the end of each round, when you reveal the cards you've played, you may optionally put follies on cards which um, have the matching symbols. So this is a rose folly, so I can put it on a rose card. Then uh, the next round, you're actually going to play your cards in a grid. There's not a geographical element in the base game of Flourish. Um, but there is when you're playing with Follies, because you're going to play round one, two, and three in a grid, and then round four, you can put those cards anywhere around your edge, because each of these Follies gives you points, depending on how many more of those matching symbols are to be found on its card, and any cards that are orthogonally adjacent. There's also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, because uh, I think a lot of people are going to like this, one of the tiny little modules in the Flourish uh, Signature Edition is something called the Friends Deck, which is just a deck of nice animals, and you're dealt two friends at the start of the game. Look, you can be fr I can be friends with a horse or a bat. <laughs> now, at the end of the game, you'll pick one of those to be your true friend, if you will, and they're going to give you um, points for each one of those matching features. So if I choose to be friends with a bat, and of course, who wouldn't, uh, that's going to give me five points for every tree in my garden. So there you have it, that's Flourish. Absolutely gorgeous to look at, obviously. Extremely simple, nice big chunky components. So if you like bucolic themes, if you like three-dimensional follies, if you like looking at pretty illustrations, gorgeous illustrations really, of Ivy, this one could be a winner for you. On to the next game. Aquatica is a one to four player engine building card based game where you we're playing as a ruler under the sea trying to maintain a prosperous realm in the briny depths. Uh, this game is a gorgeous blue crunchy little family weight thing with simple decisions and a simple teach but deep and cascading consequences. This game is brought to you by Arcane Wonders and Cosmodrome Games and is designed by Ivan Tosovsky. And without further ado, let's get into how you play. We'll start by talking about the different kinds of cards you get in Aquatica, the first of which being these character cards. You start with a hand of them, and each one of them has a unique effect, which we'll go into later. But largely, you can use them to buy new cards to add to your hand, add locations to your player board, or raise those locations up from the depths to score points. You'll start with a little hand and you'll gather more as you go through the game. You'll also start with a king card that gives you a unique ability. These can be drafted or dealt at random if you so desire, and they add a tinge of asymmetry to every game. The next kind of card you have are these location cards shown along here and in this chunky deck. And each one of these is going to have a cost at the top, which shows you how much it's going to cost in power or coins to conquer or purchase that location, respectively. And then along the side, you have a number of depth effects. We'll get to those later. And at the bottom, a number of points that you might score when you score that card. The next major component are these little manta ray tokens, and you start with four of them and they all have little effects on the back. And these effects will let you supplement your actions. So for example, if you're purchasing something, you could flip over this little manta ray with a one coin on him to then have an additional coin to purchase things with a little later on, which is neat. However, they get tired pretty easily, and once you've used them, they flip onto their backs and have a little lie down for you to then flip them over a bit later by using another action, which we'll get to later. So those are the main components of the game, but to know how to use them, we need to know what you do on your turn. And luckily, it's very simple. All you need to do is take a main action and any number of additional actions. And all the main action is, is taking a card from your hand and playing it to your discard, resolving its effects. The most important of those actions is gaining power or coins and using those power or coins to conquer or buy locations respectively. For example, this Legionnaire card gives you three power and lets you use that power to conquer a location. So if you played that card, you'd look at these available locations in this row here and choose one that's worth three power and take it, adding it to your board and sinking it up to the first possible depth that is available. That's nice and simple. However, you'll notice that some of these cards have higher values. Like this one over here will cost you five power. How would I take that with just this measly Legionnaire? Well, when you play that, you can supplement your main action with additional actions, such as flipping over one of these Manta Rays that gives you plus two power. You flip them over to its tired side, and then you take the respective thing and add it into your 
little player board like so. So now I have that location in my board. However, if I didn't have that manta ray available, I could look to my locations themselves for ways to supplement my power with additional actions. This one here gives me plus two power when I conquer volcanic locations. So what I could do is I could take that and I could use my legionnaire for three power and then slide this little thing up to show that I've used that power and add the new location to my board. Also, using their locations for their effects and sliding them up every time you do so is great because it means that you're getting closer and closer to being able to score that card. When none of the symbols are visible except for this little banner at the bottom, you can play a card that will let you score and then take that location and put it into your score pile and it's worth that many points at the end of the game as listed on the bottom of the card. Some of these cards, like this one, also let you tame wild mantas. And when you do so, you take the appropriate manta from the pile and add that to your little bank of them, ready to use their effects a little later as well. Sometimes you'll notice that there are little blank spaces on these cards, and that means that you can't use them for an effect, so what are they for? Well, these spaces can only be passed by taking a raise action, like the one on this card. And when you take that action, you can supplement it with uh, icons on mantas or on existing cards, you can then raise locations, skipping past the little bonus spaces or empty spaces to get them to the scoring zone quicker. So for example, this guy lets me raise two so I could raise this right up to its scoring location, which is pretty nifty. So you're playing cards and you're taking actions and everything is going well, but you might at some point look at these characters along here and think, I want one of those. And when you do that, you can play a recruit action and then supplement it with additional coins to buy one of these characters from the available pool and put them into your hand. And this means that you can fine tune your little deck of cards, making it more and more efficient and mean and capable of building great empires faster. And then when you've played enough cards, you can use your Matrona card to draw all of them back up and then flip your mantas back over. But to get the most efficiency, you'll obviously want to use as many cards and mantas as possible before that happens. So that's the basic flow of the game. Playing cards to recruit more characters, to buy locations, to add them to your board, to raise them up, to score points. However, there's a couple other things I really want to quickly touch on. And the first is that there are goals at the top of the board that are worth points at the end of the game, such as having three cards in your score pile or eight cards in your hand. When you achieve those, you take one of your available starting mantas and put them on the spot to show that you've claimed it. And that is basically the whole game. It ends when someone has completed four of these goals or gone through the whole deck of character cards or the entire deck of location cards. Whoever has the most points at the end is the winner. This looks to be a very cozy, medium weight engine building game where what hooks you in each turn are the opportunities to fine tune your machine to pump out points and prizes. And what's also neat is that because you're adding these new character cards into each person's deck every single turn, people are going to be going for the same places every single time, but go about them in very different ways. And if you want things a little fiddlier, there is of course an advanced variant where you draft the king cards that make your decks unique from the start, as well as having variable goals at the top of the board. That is all of Aquatica, and it is all of this installment of Or Shucks Previews. Uh, if you are free on the 16th to 18th of October, which could be right now, or it could be in the past, or it could be in the future, depending on when you watch this video, then why not come along to our exciting online convention? We'll be hosting so many live shows across the weekend, as well as offering product previews and demos from loads of different publishers all around the world. And as well as that, we've also got some exclusive Or Shucks and Shut Up and Sit Down merch now available on the web store, designed by me and designed by Matt, which is very exciting, I think. And if any of that sounds like not your cup of tea, then don't worry, we have got a whole YouTube channel's worth of excellent content ready for your eyes to watch. And that is all for me. Have a lovely day. Bye.